all of our predictions for the future of the Earth's climate and how it heats up and indeed all of our understanding of how a lot of the weather systems of the planet work are tied down to how well we understand the oceans. We know the general circulation of the ocean, of course, but still we have a lot of things that we don't know and there are so many questions that we need to answer. If you've ever been on a ship and you look around and there's nothing you can see for kilometres except blue water, it's incredible. I don't know, there's something about it that makes you feel in a way so insignificant. You're just a tiny blip on the geological timeline, more or less, you know. We are going to the North Atlantic and the North Atlantic is part of a huge circulation called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Actually, we study the overflow from the Nordic seas into the North Atlantic, and this is a part of this circulation system which affects the climate in Northern Europe. 28 days or so at sea. I guess it's not the longest anyone's done, but probably not the shortest either. <laughs> We have 15 climate scientists and oceanographers from the University of Hamburg. We have someone from Canada, from Australia, from Germany, from Iran, from everywhere, from different backgrounds. We also have approximately 30 crew members with us who know a lot more about being on boats than us. Meteor is actually a very nice ship. It's always a bit narrow and it's reminds you really of this is a ship that has a deep history in every part. And it looks like it too, in a nice way. <laughs> it's got character. <laughs>
I think this was, yeah, it's, it was, it's fascinating for me, the ocean. With all the power in it also, and the, the life, I don't know. I could look forever at the ocean. It's hard to explain, it's just pure joy and not so much thinking. We went up onto the top deck just after we'd finished working and it was really windy, um, so you were out in the elements, but you could just look in 360 degrees around you and there was nothing in sight except from sea. And it was a, quite an incredible feeling to just think, it's just us on this boat and then absolutely nothing around. The ship is really some kind of isolated world itself. It's totally independent. Yeah. So we have different laboratories. We have wet labs and dry labs. You have the bridge, a multitude of decks. The ship's like a maze. It's very easy to get lost. There's so many different sets of stairs going to the same place. We have the mess hall, living quarters. A laundry. Plenty of storage facilities. Table tennis table. There's a gym and a sauna, which I'm planning on getting some time in. What we need exactly is to run 24 hours work because the ship is expensive. Students, they do the main work. At least they do the shifts, city the shifts. Four hours of working, eight hours not working, and another four hours working again. You're tired a lot of the time. Your sleeping pattern is super weird. For example, yesterday, I think I woke up maybe four times in one day, which the human body isn't really built for. Didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> it can take it out of you, but it's rewarding when we can see what we came all this way to see. What we can see is if this overflow is changing in time and space. Two ways that we can monitor them. One with the CTD, going on top of the water, look into the profile. C is for conductivity, T is temperature, D is depth. So what we're doing is we are sending down what is essentially a very expensive thermometer and we are looking for patterns in the temperature and salinity of the water right at the bottom. For me right now it's a great opportunity to see how these observations are. <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We've had some, I mean, someone who's not been on a boat like me, there were quite big waves. When you put the CTD in the water and there's lots of waves, then it starts to swing. We were in this room and sliding all over the floor. There's a lot of attention and care that you need when you're putting it in, but the crew know what they're doing. That's what I, that's what I rely on most of the time anyway. But CTD measurement is just part of the measurement. To detect climate change, you would need a long time series. What we're doing is part of this long time series. What you can't do from a CTD is look at the conditions on the bottom of the sea floor for one day, five days, three months, a year, you can't get that sort of information from a CTD because we all like to go home and be on dry land at some point. A mooring is a way that you can get around that. We send something very heavy on a journey to the bottom of the ocean with some instruments on it and we just leave it there. When we're doing this, we're of course hoping that we can get it back again. You have a releaser because next year you want to pick up your instrument also. So when you go on top of the moorings, you command the releaser to leave the weight and come up because of the lift. You take a big speaker and throw it off the side of the ship and make it play a certain, not a certain song, but a certain chord. I mean, to us it just sounds like a, like a click, almost. But this theoretically travels through the water, hits the mooring, the mooring hears it, understands it, and then it tells us I'm going to release. <laughs> Yeah, releasing a mooring is always nerve-wracking. Usually you, you do find the moorings. We did find some moorings. 
We found four and recovered three. One of which was here in the Western Valley, on bridge at seven, waiting for the first crack of daylight. It was a bit tense. It was very, it wasn't dark, it was just gloomy. We tried to contact the mooring and it was there, which was great. We were very happy to have heard from it. But it was 75 meters away from the ship, which was quite confusing because the bottom of the ocean was 400 meters away. There were huge amounts of fish under the ship, so there was a signal sent to the mooring and we get the answer back. Uh, apparently this signal was reflected from this huge group. We had to calculate it manually. We just measure the time that we get the answer from the mooring. By doing two or three from different places, we could estimate the place of the mooring, and at the end we found it. But we found that it was broken. Because the releaser is normally vertical, but at some point you get a position of the releaser where you can see that it's horizontal, and the releaser shouldn't be horizontal because then it's laying on the ground. And when we realized this, we kind of were sure that something happened. I think six hours we were driving around trying to recover this mooring until somebody saw on the distance an Icelandic fishing vessel and thought maybe we've released it and maybe it's gone past us and maybe they've seen it. So we contacted them over the radio, have you seen a bright orange ball? Uh, and the good news was they had. And it's really unbelievable that just four days after we deployed the mooring that a fisherman caught it. It's really amazing actually all these incidents. That's the good part of the story that we have it. At least we have the data for some days. Taking observations at the sea, I think, is very challenging. <laughs> I think experiencing rough weather, uh, big waves, uh, you really have to love this thing. I think everybody was putting on a brave face, but you were constantly aware that you had a stomach in the middle of your body, and you were constantly aware that it was moving around in ways that it wasn't used to moving around. It's like a luxury prison on board. You can move around, yes, but you cannot escape, right? You cannot go for a walk in a park or something like this. And I really miss this, yes. Also trees. Not just trees, maybe even a rock would be quite nice. Or some dirt. I don't really mind at this stage in the cruise, just something that's not wet. <laughs> the smell. I, I miss the smell of land most. Yeah, I do miss my bed. It's hard and you get tired, but on the other hand, you do it with joy. Every time we do something or we look, it's something that no human has ever seen before. You're the first one to see it. And this is always absolutely fascinating. This, personally for me, is worth the expedition on its own right. I think that we're here on this planet, and while we're here, what else are we going to do other than look around us? I think it's just interesting. If you study ocean, you study climate, and climate is the future because society, people, animals, we all need this. And if we have like a warmer climate, we all need to adapt to this warmer climate, and cultures will change, people will change. The link between the measurements that we're doing and the effects of climate change. They're hidden behind physics and behind computer models and it's, there's quite a distance, especially for people who aren't oceanographers or who aren't climate scientists. But these things have value and every little piece that we uncover, every little extra complication in the systems which keep us alive on this planet, I think that knowledge enriches us and helps us understand just how fragile we are and just how much we should appreciate the fact that we're here and how much we should look after these things.
we should care about this because it determines our life. The changes, I mean, if it keeps going on as it is now, everything is fine, I think, but it will change. We know this, climate change, and this will affect hundreds of millions of people who are living at the coast on all continents. And this is why we have to care for this. Do you think society cares enough? Mm, I don't think that society cares enough, no. It's been a very successful cruise. We've got lots of information to go back and look at when we get back to Hamburg. At the end we had more than 200 stations, which is kind of a record now. I'm super happy because we found a lot of nice water masses that we were searching for. And we have some answers to our questions based on the model results and also some more questions for the next study.